2 Samuel chapter 21. Have I said that? Yeah. All right, so we are drawing close to the end of this record that we call 2 Samuel. There are only four more chapters left here for us to go through. And, you know, in the, in the course of, of, of the closing of this book, we come across two national tragedies. First, in chapter 21, we have a drought that is caused by King Saul's sin. And then later in chapter 24, we have a plague that is caused by King David's sin. Now, obviously, these events are not in chronological order with what we've studied so far. So um, we'll get to that. I'll explain that when we get to that. But uh, wedged in between these two tragedies, we find also in this, uh, actually in the chapter we're in here, but it seems we find a, a summary, a very brief summary of four victories. And then we find a list of David's mighty men, as well as a couple of psalms that were written by David. Now, speaking of our chapter for this evening, we first come to the three-year famine. And David learns in this chapter that this is a consequence of his predecessor Saul's efforts to wipe out the Gibeonites. And that was a violation of, remember back in Joshua, the treaty? that Joshua made with the Gibeonites, and that was hundreds of years before this. So Saul was violating that treaty, and, and to make reparation, the Gibeonites demand the right to execute seven of, of Saul's male descendants. And that, that takes place in verses 3 through 14. Uh, we'll find the, the, the executions, and we find that the executions end the famine. Now, there's another trial that takes place here. And that is the continuing warfare that we see with the Philistines in verses 15 through 22. And, and these lengthy wars, which are, are only summarized briefly here, they, they end up decimating the Philistines to the point where, well, basically they're no longer any kind of serious threat to Israel again. Um, but let's not talk about the chapter. Let's dig into it. Let's pray and we'll, we'll dig in. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you for this time that we have in your word. And as we study your word, we ask that you would soften hardened hearts. Lord, that you would open up our hearts to receive from your word. Um, we love you, and we desire to, uh, to learn more about you this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verse 1, 2 Samuel 21, verse 1 says, Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them, in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. Um, the Hebrew word here for famine is ra'av, and it just means hunger. And, and you know, it's, it's one thing to be deprived of food for uh, one or two days. In fact, the Bible records periods of fasting for 40 days. But during a famine, Available food for a whole region is slowly restricted and then becomes nearly nothing, and that can go on for years. And starvation is a terrible thing, and, and it would have been terrible for David to witness the people that he loves so suffering in this way. And we're told that while this is during the days of David, the reason is from events that took place back during the reign of Saul. It reads in verse 1 that it was because Saul killed the Gibeonites. Now, the Gibeonites, they had lived in the Promised Land long before the time of the conquest of Israel. And when Israel attacked the land or went into Canaan and attacked the peoples of the land, the Gibeonites, they resorted to a trick in order uh, to try and survive. They sent envoys who were dressed in worn clothing and who were carrying aged supplies to beg Joshua and the Israelite leaders for peace. 
And in return for a uh, pact of non-aggression or a, a, a covenant of non-aggression, the Gibeonites pledged uh, allegiance to Israel. They pledged to be subjects of Israel. Now, Joshua and the, the others, they accepted this offer, but they did so without taking the time to consult with the Lord. The Bible says in Joshua 9, So Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live, and the rulers of the congregation swore to them. Now, three days later, the Israelites learned that the Gibeonite cities were actually nearby and were, in fact, a part of Israel's inheritance from the Lord. But at that point, it was too late. They had already made the covenant. And because the leaders of the assembly had sworn that covenant by the Lord, they didn't attack them. And the Gibeonite part of that covenant was that they would serve Israel. So what Joshua did was to make the Gibeonites to be woodcutters and water carriers to serve the community of Israel and to serve the altar of the Lord. But now we find that Saul had killed the Gibeonites. And nowhere in Scripture are we told when or why Saul did this, why he broke Joshua's covenant with him. Yet Joshua had violated God's command to destroy uh, the inhabitants of the promised land by not, by making that, well, excuse me, by making this covenant with them. But that vow, that covenant, it obligated them before God to then protect the Gibeonites. Uh, verse 2 makes it clear, however, that it wasn't uh, a complete killing of all Gibeonites that took place. Um, only some were killed. Um, so it was an incomplete quest by Saul to kill them all. And you may remember from our studies in 1 Samuel how Saul's uh, religious life was just so puzzling. Uh, the Bible records several times where when trying to appear godly, Saul made foolish vows for other people to keep. And at the same time, he disobeyed the clear commands of God himself. For instance, he was commanded to slay the Amalekites, yet he didn't. And here he tried to exterminate the Gibeonites. Now, another piece of the puzzle is that uh, Yehuel, Saul's great-grandfather, was actually the ancestor of the Gibeonites. So then Saul killed and sought to annihilate his own relatives. In fact, Saul's own site of his, his house, his, uh, you wouldn't call it castle, but his, his residence, his royal residence, was at Gibeah. And that was about five miles north of Jerusalem. And the Gibeonites lived nearby, about five and one-half miles northwest of Jerusalem. Now, also, Gibeon became a Levitical city. And even the tabernacle, at one point, was operating there. The city was located uh, within the, uh, the tribal area of uh, the tribe of Benjamin, which was, of course, Saul's tribe. You guys remember that? So perhaps, uh, perhaps that's a clue to Saul's behavior here. Perhaps it was that it was an embarrassment to him. As we noted in 1 Samuel, one of Saul's leadership tactics was to reward his men, his leaders, with houses and with land. Perhaps in order to do this, he was confiscating property from the Gibeonites. Another possibility is that Saul resented the permission given for Gentiles to serve the Lord in even a small way. Many times, those who appear the most pious are trying to cover for something. And many times, they become very legalistic in order to put the spotlight on others and, and take it off of themselves. And perhaps this was feigned zeal on the part of Saul to make himself appear more righteous in the eyes of others. Now, of course, all of that, it's just an educated guess. We don't know. The Bible doesn't really speak to it. But whatever his motive and his method, Saul's actions brought judgment on the people of Israel, even though he was now dead and David had long been king. 
the Talmud, which is, uh, it's, a, it's, it's not scripture. The Talmud is just collected ancient Jewish thought on the Old Testament text. Um, kind of like if you have a commentary set at home. It's, it's kind of that same idea. The commentary is not scripture, right? It's, it's some man's thought about scripture, what, what they thought it means in certain areas, their interpretation of certain things. Um, but the Talmud, it does imply that there was some guilt on all Israelites in this because there was a generalized mistreatment of the Gibeonites by the Israelites. So the famine continued for three years. The first year uh, might have caused some, some fretting because there was just an unexpected change of things. The second year probably so people were thinking, well, you know, we're dipping into the reserves now, um, but things are bound to improve. But then that third year, the famine was still going. And so David then sought the face of the Lord. Now, most often, famine, well, not most, I don't want to say most often, but many times, famine, there's other reasons you can have famine, but sometimes famine is a result of a lack of rain. And we find out later in this chapter that was what exactly was going on here. And Deuteronomy 28 records that God would send the rain to the land if his people would honor and obey him. Numbers 35 records that the sin of murder would pollute the land. And that's exactly what was causing their trouble here. Now, David knew because he inquired of the Lord. How he inquired of the Lord is not stated here. Um, it it might have been through the prophet Nathan. It might have been through David's uh, priest, uh, Ira. Whatever the case, the Lord told David that it was because of Saul seeking to kill the Gibeonites. And by this time, Saul had been dead for over 30 years. And this, this highlights for us, I think, the, the, the patience of the Lord in dealing with sins, as well as his willingness to forgive. Verse 3, Therefore David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? That's an interesting phrase. We'll get to that in a second. That, that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. This it seems like a strange thing for him to be saying since um, Israel were the guilty ones in this uh, particular context. And the Gibeonites said to him, We will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. Then they answered the king, as, as for the man who consumed us and plotted against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the territories of Israel, let seven men of his descendants be delivered to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord chose. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. So the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth. This, that's a different Mephibosheth. That's not the same one. You know, people did have the same names back then. So, um, you know, it's not unusual to see one name repeated, but especially within a family. Many families today have kids uh, you know, that have more than a handful of kids might have two kids named similar names or even named the same name. Um, but the king spared Mephibosheth, uh, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the, oh, I'm sorry, I backed up. So the king took Armani and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Ritzbah, the daughter of uh, Ai, whom she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she uh, brought up for Azriel, the son of Barza, Barzili, Barz, Barzili, the Me, uh, the Me, the Mehel, <laughs> ah, the Meholathite. That, that doesn't roll off the tongue. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days in the beginning of barley harvest. So 
upon seeing the, the, the people had suffered for so long and seeing no end to this famine, David desires to take some action here. And so when he learns the facts, David immediately offers to make restitution. He said, what shall I do for you and with what shall I make atonement? But here's the twist. He then said that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. This sin of Saul was preventing the Gibeonites from blessing the people of Israel. Now, of course, let's not forget what is written in Genesis 12. There it says, I will bless those who bless you. Their treatment at the hands of Saul and the Israelites had caused the Gibeonites to harden their hearts toward Israel. Repentance and restitution has a way of softening hearts. But the Gibeonites surprised David. Now, the implication of their response is kind of missed in the New King James Version, and it's confused in the NIV uh, where it says, we have no right. I think the, the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, I think the Septuagint gets it better. And there it reads, and the Gibeonites said to him, we have no question about silver or gold with Saul and with his house, and there is no man for us to put to death in Israel. In other words, it's not a matter of paying us back with money, and Saul is no longer around that he can pay for his crime. Instead, they said, continuing in the Septuagint here, they said, the man who would have made an end of us and persecuted us, who plotted against us to destroy us, let us utterly destroy him so that he shall have no standing in all the coasts of Israel. So this was an eye for an eye kind of thought process that they were going through here. And by the way, when it says Second Kingdoms, the, the Hebrew Bible has a different order <laughs> of the books and different names for the books. And in the Septuagint, there's First Kings, Second Kings, Third Kings, and Fourth Kings, right? So it's it's different. It's the same text. It's just divided up a little bit differently. Um, <laughs> So, you know, an eye for an eye kind of thought process here. And the demand of the law, as we know from Exodus 21, 24, is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So their thought process is he sought to utterly destroy us. Let us utterly destroy his progeny. And so they asked for seven of his male descendants to be delivered to them that they should be put to death. So then, it was seven of Saul's male descendants to die by hanging from a tree instead of the general population of Israel to die from famine. But we also might recognize something in this that we would, that would later be said by the high priest of Israel in reference to Jesus. In John 11, he said, do you consider, it, consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish? Now, of course, that's not a perfect comparison. But still, the idea is there. Along with being hung from a tree, as the text says, before the Lord. The idea here is that it would take the shedding of blood to atone for the Gibeonite blood that had been shed. Now, the nation was suffering because of Saul's sins. And if David just killed any man, that wasn't going to solve the problem. These seven would bear the guilt of Israel. Now, of course, today we have the New Testament and we understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we look at this and we have a bit of a hard time understanding this. But we need to keep in mind that here we are dealing with law, not grace. We need to remember, however, that the death of these seven men was not atonement. 
It was legal retribution. And though David didn't commit the crime, he now had to go and choose the seven who would die. And, uh, and that, of course, wasn't an easy thing to do. Now, David had previously, in 1 Samuel 20, made a vow to his friend Jonathan to protect his descendants. And so David didn't then uh, name Mephibosheth. He had received Mephibosheth as if a member of his own family. Instead, he chose two sons of Saul's concubine, Ritzvah, as well as five sons of Saul's daughter, Michal. Now, this is important. Michal, who was married to Azrael. Now, this is not the same Michal that we know from earlier in David's life. This is Michal, also known as Mirav, who had married Adriel. Now, also, we should note that uh, sons here does not mean children, but refers to people of adult age. Now, these, it says, were hung on the hill before the Lord. And this was probably, uh, this hill before the Lord was probably the Gibeonite high place that's mentioned later on in 1 Kings 3 uh, in association with Solomon. Now, this happened, it says, during barley harvest in the middle of April. And it says, they were left there until the rains came. Verse 10. Now, Ritzbah, the daughter of uh, Ayah, took sackcloth, and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. Now, I'm not, myself, I'm not familiar with weather patterns in, <laughs> I've been to Israel twice, but I'm not familiar with weather patterns at that day and age there in Israel. But commentators say that's probably about six months worth of time. So they were allowed to, to hang there from, well, for six months till sometime in late October. And Ritzbah camped there and she did not allow the birds to rest on them during that time. So she woke up and beat away the birds. She <laughs> stayed there and beat away the birds. And David was told that Ritzbah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. Then David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of uh, Yabesh Gilead, who, who had stolen them from the street of Beit Shean, where the Philistines had hung them up after the Philistines had struck down Saul in Gilboa. So he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from there, and they gathered the bones of those who had been hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and, and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin, in Zelah, in the tomb of Kish, his father. So they performed all that the king commanded, and after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. It was a custom of Jews to bury the bodies, but in the case of Saul and Jonathan, their bodies had been burned. So it was the burned bones that were collected from Jabesh. Now, you might remember that when Israel was defeated by the Philistines in the time of Saul, the bodies of Saul and his sons were hanged on the wall of Beit Shean. The inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard about it and brave men from there went and collected those bodies from the Philistines, burned them, and then buried them at Jabesh. And, and these events are recorded for us in the final chapter of 1 Samuel. Now, David allowed the bodies to, regarding these these. Uh, seven that, that were hung here, David allowed uh, the bodies to remain exposed until the rains came. The rains coming signifying that the Lord was blessing his people again. So then the bones of Saul and his sons and uh, here his grandsons 
were gathered together and they were buried in Zela in the tribal lands of Benjamin. And that was where his father was buried, his father Kish. As it is today, I mean, to have burial with one's ancestors was something that was desirable. It was, it was what you wanted. And David granted this blessing to Saul and his family. So, you know, we're, we're all probably looking at this and we're like, we just have questions. And, and many of those questions that we probably have can't be answered with any information that we're given. One thing we can be certain from all of this is that sin is very serious. One man's sins can bring sorrow and death to his whole family, even after he's dead and buried. In fact, Romans 5 tells us, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And the Bible also says in Romans 5, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law can't save. It can only point out our sinfulness. So how then does grace abound much more? Because the law points us to our need for a Savior. Paul said in Romans 7, On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Some would say then, Well, then I'll definitely be getting into heaven by just being good. And Paul said in Romans 3, Therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You may think, well, hey, I've gone my whole life without stealing. But have you told a lie? Oh, well, at least I haven't stolen anything. But the Bible says in James 2, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point, he's guilty of all. So then you cannot expect to be found righteous by the law when you are guilty. And we say, well, I'm basically a good person, but the truth is, in Romans 7, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. And in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. But God has made the way through himself, Jesus Christ. Though he was sinless, he willingly bore the penalty for our sin. Romans 5, 6 through, 6 through 8, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is not because we merit it, but it's by grace through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, says Ephesians 2. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And how is that gift received? Very simply by belief, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is is made unto salvation. Verse 15, When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. Then Ishvi Benov, who was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Avishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench 
the lamp of Israel. So in this section that we've, we've now moved into here, we're presented with those four conflicts I talked about that took place during David's reign as king. And these are not chronological. They took place at various times early on in David's reign, probably after, so probably sometime after uh, he made Jerusalem his capital um, and the Philistines uh, began to really oppose his rise to power. Now what's interesting is that all four incidents involve descendants of the giants from Philistia. Now, one of whom in verse 19 was Lachmi, a brother of Goliath. Verses 15 through 17, which we just read there, they detailed the first conflict. And during this first battle, because of who he was, the Philistines focused on David. And David fought so hard that he couldn't fight anymore. Now, there's a giant here, and he was going after David. And this man was a, uh, it says, son of the giant. Actually, it's better translated one of the descendants of the giants. And he was named Ishvi Benov. And to give us an idea of how big this man was, it says that his bronze spear was 300 shekels, which is actually a disappointing seven and a half pounds. <laughs> that's about, I mean, I'm not, I'm not bragging on myself by any means, but that's about two pounds lighter than a bass guitar. Careful, I'll lob it your way. <laughs> That's half the weight of Goliath's spear. So, though this man was a descendant of the giants, he was not exactly the giant that Goliath was. But he was motivated. He bad wanted to kill David. And David was exhausted. But David's nephew, Avishai, came to the king's rescue and he killed the giant. David had presented such a fortuitous target to the enemy soldiers that this narrow escape for him was kind of like, it was like the last straw for his men. And they decided that, that David was just too valuable to be going out and fighting with them in the battlefield. They said that he was the lamp of Israel and he had to be protected. Now that phrase, lamp of Israel, is very interesting here since the Messiah, the light of the world, would come through the royal line of David. Something else that's interesting here considering how we talked about the consequences of sin in the previous section, is the giant's name. In a way, it, it alludes to something from David's past, something that happened when he was running from Saul. The name Ishvi Benov is a contraction of the Hebrew sentence, a man who came because of the matter of Nov. And Nov was the name of that place where the priests were slaughtered by Saul. But why were the priests slaughtered by Saul? Well, it goes back to David lying, trying, trusting in his own methods to survive when he was fleeing from Saul, taking matters into his own hands instead of trusting in God. Verse 18. Now, it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then uh, uh, Sevichai, Sev the uh, Hushathite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Yare uh, Orachim, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, 
the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So again, there was a battle with the Philistines. Actually, two here mentioned at a place called Gob or Gov. Um, in verse 18, Israel won the battle because one of David's mighty men or his uh, gibberim killed the giant. Now, as was the last time when it says the giant, the phrase should be one of the, the descendants of the giants or the Rephaim. Um, that's the word that's used there, Repha. But it, it's in the context that it's used, the way it's used in the Hebrew, it, it's meant to be plural, Rephaim. And also in verse 19, only that time the giant was the brother of Goliath. The giant whom David killed when he was a young boy. Now, we don't know where Gov, the place that this battle or both these battles took place, was located. It could have been a place near Bethlehem, uh, near modern Husan. But it's speculated that, it, that, that Gov could actually be uh, another name for Gath. In fact, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uses Gath here. And then later in this chapter, there are other battles that, that take place in Gath, or, or the Gath is mentioned is in regard to the other battles. Now, I'm going to let you in on something here. Um, in the New King James Version, the words, the brother of, are italicized because they were added to the original text. And this was most often done in order to add clarity, which it usually does. And sometimes things just don't translate well from one language into another, and it helps to add words to make the meaning more clear. There's some question, though, as to whether this should have been done in this case. Now, without it there, it reads, Again, there was war at Gov with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Yare uh, Orachim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So then we have to wonder what's going on here. Because without that text, it says that this person, Elhanan, killed Goliath the Gittite. David was supposed to have killed Goliath, as recorded back in 1 Samuel 17. Now, it could be that David and Elhanan are one and the same, meaning that one is a family name and one is his royal name. You know, it, sometimes, it, you know, my name, uh, sometimes I'll use my middle name. Most of the time I use my middle name, Sean. But sometimes when I'm signing a, an important document, I'll use my first name, Benny. I'm the same person. I do the same things. <laughs> I just have two different names that I can use. And other people may use to refer to me. Now, at the same time here, we also know that Elchanan was the name of one of David's leaders. And again, there are many other people in this world that are named Sean. Most of them spell their name wrong. <laughs> but again, <laughs> there are many people that use the name Sean. So there's just some question here as to what's, what's going on. Um, the answer is either David, also is known as Elchanan, or that the italicized words that were added in there actually should be there um, and do add clarity to the text. Um, in fact, toward that, we can look to a parallel text in 1 Chronicles 20, and there the phrase in the actual text does occur, the brother of Goliath. So then... My conclusion here, and I, I, I enjoy textual criticism. I, I love comparing things and figuring things out. Um, my conclusion is that, that the brother of is a legitimate uh, addition here to the text, and, and it should exist here. Um, but certainly, you know, feel free to do your own research on that.
and you, you may come to a different conclusion. It doesn't change anything. Um, it's just very interesting, uh, the, the interesting possibility that, um, that that exists there. Verse 20. Yet again there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, uh, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Okay. So we're going to wrap it up here with this fourth battle. It took place in Gath, which was firmly in Philistine territory. And in this battle, David's nephew, Jonathan, killed the giant who had, like Goliath, defied Israel and God. So then, we've made note already that when it said, son of the giant, it should be translated descendants of the giant. Who were these descendants of the giants? Well, we find out here for sure that they were born to the giant in Gath, who fell by the hand of David. And we all know who that was. So the four Rephaim spoken of here, three were sons of Goliath, one was brother of Goliath. Now, I wonder why in this chapter that primarily had to do with uh, the famine and, and David having to uh, hand over those seven of Saul's descendants. I wonder why, kind of wrapping it up here, it just briefly mentions these four conflicts in which there was, in, in each of them, which featured a giant. I think that they were mentioned here because of what that previous section pointed us to. That is... <laughs> that the sinner is condemned under the law. You see, the tie-in here with the giants is that they were all connected to Goliath. Now, many times we have probably heard the narrative of David and Goliath used as an allegory of how we have to overcome the hurdles in life. And unfortunately, that robs the text of its true intent. You see, David in that narrative is a picture of Jesus Christ who defeated our greatest enemy, death. And I, I think that the Holy Spirit in this text, by adding these things in here, is pointing us to that conclusion, pointing us towards Christ, who is our Savior. Because... Sin has to be judged. And there is only one Savior who is Jesus Christ who defeated the giant. Paul wrote this to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll close with this. He said, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, Father, we thank you for this evening and this study in your word. And Lord, we ask that you would make your word fertile in our lives to, to do those things that you desire it to do. Um, we thank you that you love us so much. We thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and that salvation is by grace through faith and not of any work that we do. Heavenly Father, we love you. We desire to please you with our lives, Lord, and we ask that you would lead us in how we may do that, how we may glorify you. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face and his light to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and everyone said, Amen.